Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today, let's spend a few minutes with American Philosophy, A Love Story by John Cagg. This book was originally published back in 2016, and I read a 2017 paperback edition. So, an American Philosophy, A Love Story by John Cagg. So this is a work of nonfiction. It's part memoir and part history of American philosophy, um, particularly this era of the 19th century, late 19th century. Um, the author, John Cagg, divides the book up into three different parts, and the parts of part one is called Hell, part two is called Purgatory, and part three is called Redemption. And this reflects sort of his journey, his journey of personal discovery that he goes on throughout the book. So as the book opens, the author is really an unhappy person. He's a grad student, I guess, in philosophy, and that he's really disillusioned and sort of lost in that whole process. And then on top of that, he's in a unha really unhappy marriage where he um, doesn't really know how to, to get out of that. And then his father dies, and his father, I guess, he, he and his father had somewhat of a uh, estranged relationship. So... But anyway, he um, these sort of three things are going on in his life, and he's a pretty unhappy fellow in the first part of the book. And he goes away one weekend to a place in New Hampshire that I'm probably going to mispronounce, so New Hampshire natives, um, feel free to correct me in the comments, but it's Chikora. It's C-H-O-C-O-R-U-A. Chikora is how I have heard it on YouTube pronounced. So... What it is in this town, this little small town in in in, um, in New Hampshire, he's going to he's supposed to meet up with some people to plan a conference, a philosoph philosophy conference in this town, and in the process of being there at this at this uh, coffee shop, he meets this this old older man who volunteers to take him up to West Wind. West Wind is the estate of the American philosopher William Ernest Hawking. And so the biography of William Ernest Hawking says, uh, lived August 10th, 1873 to June 12th, 1966, was an American idealist philosopher at Harvard University. He continued the work of his philosophical teacher, Josiah Royce, the founder of American idealism, in revising idealism to integrate it and fit it into empiricism, naturalism, and pragmatism. He said that metaphysics has to make inductions from experience. That which does not work is not true, quote. His major field of study was the philosophy of religion, but his 22 books included discussions of philosophy and human rights, world politics, freedom of the press, the psychology, the philosophical psychology of human nature, education, and more. So this philosopher's library, his estate, and then his library was there in this, uh, in a, in nearby this small town in New Hampshire. And so when this older man takes the author to the library, it's basically as it has been, basically as it was, um, you know, for the last century, basically. And it turns out William Ernest Hawking had first editions and had... Um, just a wealth of information from, he knew all the great philosophers, um, American philosophers of the 20th century, early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, he has just this phenomenal library and through a process, uh, the author winds up getting the agreement of the family to try to preserve this library because it's in not, it's, it's just in this sort of um, li the library where it's always been, which is a, a separate sort of building on the estate, and it's not really climate controlled, and you know, there's mice in there, and there's all sorts of things that are bad for books in there, and the family agrees to have him um, go through the collection and get the most valuable works and get them into get them into proper storage for possible donation to a university or something in the future. So he sets out to do that, and it's, it's, it's through this process then that he ends up having this journey of self-discovery and self-awareness through philosophy, you know, because philosophy uh, traditionally has been a sort of a self-help tool for people throughout the, you know, recorded history, really. Philosophy is not necessarily just sort of thinking on these abstract concepts, but really practical and gives people tools on really how to live a good life. 
So, um, and, and, and that's really the existential question that's asked early on in the book that he's asking himself, actually, is, is his life worth living? You know, is it really worth living? And so through these uh, works, different works, and a lot of them are highlighted, um, Walt Whitman, Emerson, um, Royce, like I mentioned, who was this guy's teacher, um, Hawking himself, um, William James, and lots and lots of others, including people that influence them, Europeans who influence them. But we get this sense of what American philosophy is, and then, you know, how it helped this guy, this particular uh, man, this author, sort of work through his life's um, issues that he was having. So the main thing at the core of American philosophy I wrote down in my notes um, is this feeling of freedom. So American philosophy as opposed to European philosophy, so American philosophy really started coming into its own and developed something really unique to itself in, in basically the 19th century. You know, it was built on European uh, roots, but actually the 19th century philosophers in the U.S. took the, the European philosophers as well as um, philosophers of the East and sort of took their ideas and, and, and melded it into something really particularly, really American. So that was kind of a surprise to me because in this collection there were, there was all sorts of, um, writings, not just European. There was also, um, like I mentioned, Eastern, Eastern type writings. So we know that the philosophers like William James studied Eastern thought as well. So, um, yeah, I, the way I thought I would approach this chat is since there's, the book is not linear. So like, it doesn't set up like, oh, you know, now I, read Emerson and I had this epiphany. That's not how it was. It was just sort of um, a discussion of, as he came across books, we have a discussion of that person or what that book meant to um, philosophy in general, or how it contributed to American philosophy. But, um, you know, so it's really would not be easy to say, you know, the, this was the, the author's journey because it wasn't in that sort of linear way. Um, so it was, um, though, um, through the process, he did, like I said, reach what we call redemption in the third part of the book. But there was a, a early on in the book, there was a um, passage about the Divine Comedy. And, you know, if you take, take the way the book is divided into hell, purgatory, and... Um, and redemption, that sort of reminds us of Dante, right? And apparently Dante in the 19th century, folks like Emerson were very, um, inf very much influenced by Dante. And so there was a part here about Dante that I thought was real cool that I would just read real quick. Um, it says here, moments of insight do occasionally happen, but Dante's point is that the real trick to salvation is that there's no trick to salvation. <laughs> It's just work, plain and not all that simple. Salvation is revealed in the long road of freedom and love. Pragmatists like Pierce and James, who assumed the mantle of philosophy from Emerson after the Civil War, knew that this journey was an arduous one and that it almost always began in hell. So I thought that was kind of cool because that's like, you know, the, the answer to life's questions aren't, like, there's not just something like, oh, this is the answer, you know, like 42, <laughs> like, you know, from uh, Douglas Adams. It's, there's not a simple answer like that. It's actually a journey. So a person to reach salvation has to go on this journey. And the journey almost always begins at some point of suffering and then a journey on then towards salvation and redemption. So I thought that was really cool. And I wasn't really aware of how influenced the, uh, the philosophy of the 19th century American philosophers were by Dante. So that was kind of cool to find out as well. So I wrote down a couple of other kind of concepts that I thought were really cool, and that is this feeling of freedom. So freedom uh, is really one of the key aspects of Amer this American philosophy. Freedom and what is freedom and what is free will and how much free will do we actually have? And there's a quote about free will that I thought I would read too that was, re was really cool. This is from William James. So, you know, as the 19th century wound, went on, you know, there's more scientific discoveries, for example, Darwin's theory of evolution. And so we began to say that some, we began to understand that some things are determined, you know, by 
nature. But how much of that is how much of that is true? So the United States, are, you know, American philosophy is typically built on the pattern or the notion that people have uh, quite a bit of free will in what they do. They can choose what to do. This quote from William James I thought was real cool about free will. He says, it's in a letter. He's writing this letter, um, actually, to... Um, I'm not sure who he's writing the letter to, but anyway, he write, he's writing this letter, and this is from the letter. I, he says, I think that yesterday was a crisis in my life. I finished the first part of Renouvier's second essays and see no reason why his definition of free will, the sustaining of a thought because I choose to when I, have, when I might have other thoughts, needs to be the definition of an illusion. At any rate, I will assume for the present, until next year, that it is no illusion. My first act of free will shall be to believe in free will. So he's saying here that you know we have free will because we we choose to believe we choose to think about something when we might choose to think about something else. So I thought that was kind of a cool quote though. Um, yeah. So free will, you know, that's an ongoing sort of theme about how much power and control we have over our own lives and how much we're free to determine our own life. Um, and this is sort of at core of at one of the cores of American uh, philosophy, uh, according to this book. Um, a couple of other quotes here that I had written down that I thought was pretty cool. Um, Thoreau says um, this concept from Thoreau. This is not a quote, but this is the idea of it's not that life is too hard; it's that it's become too easy. I wrote that down. You know that it's not that we have to struggle to live in the United States anymore because we're a fairly affluent country. So most people, some people do, but most people have their basic needs taken care of. Our struggle is actually to learn how to be free, to learn what to do when we no longer have to devote our attention to just ba providing for our basics. That's a challenge. Uh, so I thought that was cool. And then another um, quote, I think this was from Emerson as well. I think this was actually a quote. For nonconformity, the world whips you with its displeasure. <laughs> True. For nonconformity, the world whips you with its di displeasure. Then there was this section, uh, not section, but Jane Addams was talked about the great social reformer. And this idea of, I got, I wrote down, jotted down this idea about education from this section about Jane Addams, um, where Jane Ad it says education is not, I wrote down, education is not something that you get, but that you live through. Meaning that you don't just receive an education, you actually have to live through it. You have to participate in, in it in order to actually have it. So I thought that was cool too. So before I run out of time, just a couple of, one more thing that uh, kind of a final thought that the, a uh, couple of final thoughts that the author had that evolution, love is, love is an evolutionary force. I wrote that down from the book and also freedom uh, in the American perspective. Freedom and love is what pushes us forward um, according to um, the author here. I uh, thought I would just read a final sort of uh, quote from the book here um, about the cult of the dead. So the cult of the dead is like this idea that, you know, there's people in the past that have a wisdom. They might not, it might be a hundred years ago, but there's still a wisdom um, and to, to be obtained from the past. And this is what the author discovers by going through these philosophers of the past. You know, he achieved a certain wisdom that was applicable to his life today. So I thought I would just read this quote to close. West Wind taught me many things about longevity in the face of destruction, about dealing with loss, about love and freedom, but also about the discipline of philosophy. Philosophy and the humanities more generally once served as an effective cult of the dead, documenting, explaining, and revitalizing the meaning and value of human pursuits. It tried to figure out how to preserve what is noble and most worthy about us. At its best, philosophy tried to explain why our lives, so fragile and ephemeral, might have lasting significance. In Hawking's words, in The Meaning of Immortality, we must learn to treat the present moment as if it were engaged in business allotted to it by that total life which stretches indefinitely beyond. So I thought that was kind of a cool quote because it's 
the treat the present moment as if it were engaged in business allotted to it by that total life which stretches indefinitely beyond our lives have significance beyond us even though we will all most of us be forgotten by history in the future um you know our life still has significance to the future because of what we do today and i thought that was a very powerful thing all right, so I'm out of time. My next uh, chat is going to be Real Life by Brandon Taylor. I am almost finished with this, so I will have a chat on this coming up very soon. Until next time, take care. Bye.